Before I begin, I thought it would be helpful to know who is in my audience. So I would like anyone who's family members, parents to raise their hand that are here as family members of Kids with Fragile X. <laughs> and then support workers. Yeah, and private therapists. And Ted Brown, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I have to give Ted a little trouble because we have known each other for a long time, so it's kind of fun to see, to see him again. So good, I'm glad that you're here. Uh, hopefully this will be helpful. We, uh, last night we did a little uh, blurb on those individuals who were younger and adolescents, and so I did a presentation kind of focusing more on independence and school help, and now we're taking it to the next step so that all of these guys that I started working with a long time ago have grown up. And that's kind of scary for me, um, probably for them too. But I've been able to track and to look at the longevity of the disorder to kind of uh, look at what they can do now and sort of go back and remember them and even some videos of them when they were really much younger and having so much trouble. We do have to remember that it's a developmental, t developmental disability. And that simply means that they continue to move forward they don't keep up with their peers, but they seem to be able to grow um, little by little. And every year I see a difference in them. And some of the things that I thought they'd never do when they were very young, they are doing as adults. And so it's very encouraging for me uh, to continue my therapy with them. So in Colorado Springs, uh, I'm from Co uh, the state of Colorado, which is the mile high state. Um, we were laughing about that earlier uh, because we have legalized uh, pot. So <laughs> everybody, everybody can be a mile higher or even higher than that if they want. <laughs> and um, so anyway, I have a private practice there. I started out as a gen ed uh, educator. Then I decided that I kind of wanted to understand why the lower quadrant of my class, uh, those people were not learning. And so decided to get a master's in learning disabilities and um, emotional disturbances, did that. And then um, Rondi Hagerman got a hold of me, and Ted knows what that's like, because you don't stop when she grabs you. And she simply said, you need to get involved with Fragile X. We're starting a study, and that was one of those first crossovers, um, double blind. And we were looking at uh, folic acid, which is a vitamin B, really derivative, and thought maybe that would repair um, the, the chromosome as it had under the microscope, but unfortunately that didn't work quite that way. So we didn't have the level of significance in our studies that we needed uh, to prove that out. But people still take the folic acid. A lot of times Rondi will ask them to do that, uh, some mega doses of that, in addition to other pharmaceutical help. So um, anyway, that's how I got hooked on Fragile X. And it didn't take much hooking, because those of you who know individuals or have individuals in your family know how easy it is to love them and how fun they are, and that they have great senses of humor, and they're really good guys, aren't they, overall? So um, I'm hooked, and I continue to be hooked, and I'm studying them and working with them um, till I can't do it anymore, I suppose. If you want, I think Wendy and I have worked out something. We're going to take some pictures out and maybe post some of the slides later on on the website. But if you want to take pictures now of my slides, I'm fine with that. The only caveat is when there's a child in the picture or an adult in the picture, please refrain from taking that particular slide because people have granted me permission to use their children's pictures, but it's only for my use. So when I send them to, to Wendy, I'll be able to pull out the pictures of the individuals. But I always think it's fun to see uh, the people that I work with and kind of put a face uh, to a concept, so to speak. So we're going to go forward. So tonight we're just going to talk a little bit about how to support the adults that you have in your families or that you're working with or um, th having therapy with and kind of some practical strategies because I think that's really important for people to understand, well, what do you do? That's great to know that, but then what do we do about it, right? And so I've worked many years more than I want to say, but um, on some strategies that I've found success with. Really, I get a lot of questions about when parents, kids are getting older and they're becoming adults and they want to know about kind of what to expect and how much independence they should expect. And even though they've been sort of marking a long time, uh, you know, after school's out and, and they're graduated or we have uh, therapy and, and we have educational programs through the age of 21, 
uh, then it kind of drops out because the funding for the school districts no longer takes care of these individuals and so they go in to another sort of place for funding and that becomes sort of really difficult to access some of those um, supports and so again uh, looking at how that can happen and parents are saying so what should I expect you know I really don't know how much independence is appropriate uh, how can I watch my child or my client struggle so much uh, when you know everything seems to be very frustrating to these individuals and how do I reconcile the difference between those that are typically developing and then those that are not? And even in my own family, I might have typically developing uh, children and then we have our neurotypical, sorry, I want to be PC, um, and those that are, you know, that are affected with fragile X and it sort of is this sort of balance, isn't it, to try to figure out what that looks like. And then also um, the interests giving them pleasure just from a few interests. I had a mom the other day say, you know, my other kids are off and they're married and they live somewhere else and I have, you know, him and he doesn't have that much. He doesn't ask for that much. I don't spend that much money on him. Why shouldn't I just sort of coddle him and give him whatever he wants? And so what I'm trying to help her do is when they go to the store, doesn't matter which store they go to, they buy something every time. Well, you can imagine what's happening. And his sister, who's now helping with caregiving, said, you know, Mom, this is getting out of line because he's collecting all these things over and over again, and you've got to start replacing. If he brings something in, we've got to take something to uh, the thrift shop or do something with this because there's just too much. And it's, um, it's, it's sort of difficult, but yet she's saying to me, that's all he likes to do, you know. He's very simple um, and it gives him pleasure. So how do I take that away from him? And so again, I think as care, care providers, we need to understand that piece as well, don't we? Because um, putting ourselves in the shoes of the parents, it's really kind of hard sometimes to take those things away. And then um, why do I need to provide the structure? Because I'm always saying, you know, they thrive on structure. They'll have no problems if you give them the structure or fewer problems, probably should say. And they say, gosh, you know, if he's in a day program or he's in a community program, there's a lot of structure there. There's a lot of expectations. How can I do that as well? And then also um, I hear from staff with scheduling and funding limited how in the world am I going to provide the structure, the one-to-one -one that you're saying is so good for them, or at least small group? It's just not possible. And when we have all kinds of individuals with different disabilities, it's really hard to provide that. I also hear, what do I do and how do I prepare for when I'm no longer alive? I'm no longer on the planet. You know, what do I do? And so they ask that question over and over again, and they sort of have, you can kind of get them into different categories in terms of, well, we've already figured that out, and we have something set up for um, our son or our daughter. Or my other neurotypical daughter is, is planning to take this on, and, and he will live with her. Those are the kinds of things that happen. But then we have people that really don't make plans and don't really want to think about it. And I can understand that. It's pretty difficult, isn't it, to think about what's going to happen when you're gone because parents, we know that we're the best you know, caregivers, aren't we? <laughs> and uh, those of you that are doing support services feel that way too sometimes, I'm sure, or feel like you're never going to live up to what the parents really want. So it's hard all the way around, I think, for that. And then again, um, when the adults um, has to be supported to be independent, um, we know that when they're more independent, the door is open for them. And there are so many other opportunities. So as I kind of help parents along, I'll say to them, let's try really hard to, to pull this independence piece off. Let's do it as much as we can because a door is going to open and another door is going to open if he's independent. The more dependent these individuals are, the more we need to take care of them. And frankly, um, I don't think that's a good model. I think uh, they deserve uh, the, the chance to be as independent and also to really celebrate that independence and in doing things by themselves. <laughs> So how do we do that? Um, how do we build that independence? And that's really what we're talking about tonight in terms of, of, of this uh, lecture. So I have a couple of guys that I brought to you from Colorado. They're happy to be with you tonight uh, in my office. And I've asked them to talk to me a little bit about independence. These boys, both are boys, sorry, men. To me, they've been boys. I've seen each one of them, I think, 
uh, the kid on the, the left, I think I started seeing him in fourth grade, and he's now 30-something. And the other guy, um, I think, was pretty small. I remember him yelling and screaming and trying to get him into my office. I was at a different office at the time, and he also laughs about that and thinks that's pretty funny that he can walk in now and sit down and be perfectly appropriate. So see what I'm saying about the developmental disability, uh, it does keep marching on and they do make changes. So let's hear from Kyle first about independence. Now, Kyle, you moved into a group home. Yes. Tell me what's hard about being an adult in the group home. Um, you got to be more independent. Responsibilities, do your laundry, do everything. You now, do. do you do laundry at the group home? Yes. Do you cook? Yes. Do you go shopping? No. They shop for you? Yes. All right. Do you drive? No. What else do you have to do that's independent? Be responsible for your actions. Now, that's for sure. That is. That is that's a tough true. one. And then uh, make sure you have your room cleaned. Mm -hmm. Vacuum every night. Make sure you bed to made in the morning. Um, now, do you do all that? Yes. What happens if you don't? Um, uh, what happens at the group home if you don't? We get a HCT chart wrote up on us. Which means? We didn't do our chores that day. And then what's the consequence for that? No. Nope. We, we talked to my parents about that. Okay. Um, let me give you a little background on Kyle. Kyle's an interesting individual. His parents lived, um, oh, maybe 30 miles south in a small community south of where I live. And um, he graduated from high school. He was kind of the coach's assistant. And it just so happened that the small little district where he lives, um, as the assistant coach, took the state championship in football two years in a row. So he wears the big Super Bowl ring all around, and he's so proud of that. He has one for each hand. Um, very, very neat guy, and very close, as you all know. Um, all of our, our individuals with Fragile X tend to have a pretty good relationship and a closeness with their family, and they're very social. And so it surprised his mom when they decided to retire and move to New Mexico that Kyle didn't want to come along. And Kyle was thinking, you know, my sister lives in Texas. She's independent. She's married. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm not going to go to New Mexico with mom and dad. I'm going to stay in Colorado. So this was kind of tough. And it was really more tough on mom than it was on, on him, right? Because she just couldn't get over that. That She thought she'd been this great mom. And she needed to be with him and take care of him. And she's the, the one that can do it best, as we all think when we're moms. But um, Kyle really stuck to his guns, and he decided that he wanted to stay and live in this, this group home down in Canyon City, Colorado. So he's talking about the rules. He's had some hiccups. He's had some tough, tough goes of it once in a while. He's done some things that uh, really got him in trouble with the house people. Uh, but generally speaking, he's really now kind of starting to get in the groove. He's trying to figure out what he needs to do to stay at this home and to be independent because he really likes that idea of him being independent and living away from his parents. Now, Alex, on the other hand, is still living with his mother. She's a single mom. He's been with her very, very tight uh, family. And he isn't quite ready to take that step, but he has some ideas, I think, that are important to share. What do you think is the hardest part of growing up and being an adult? Change, well, growing up is changing like, like for me, I grew up, I lost weight, and if one of them people out there want to move out, moving out is hard. Why? Because you don't, let's think, I mean, you gotta do one. Got to do like responsibilities, shopping, budgeting. Yep. And everything like your own laundry. Yep. You can't depend on your parents anymore to do it for you. If you want to move out, uh, just be like independent. What about a job? A do you job. need one to move out? Yep. You need like references. So Alex kind of has lingo, right? He's kind of memorized what he's supposed to say, and probably mom has helped him with some of that. 
But acting on it is really difficult for Alex because he's still tied into his mom and kind of being with his mom and being with, with the, the family, really. Uh, so it's, it's hard for him to break away from that even though he's talking about it. Now, I will say I'm not going to give up on him uh, possibly someday moving out if that's what he wants to do. He's the one that cried and kicked and screamed coming up my steps of, of my old office and didn't think I'd ever get anywhere with him. He was extremely angry and, and uh, aggressive. But you can see at this point in time, he's able to talk about things that are kind of difficult for him to talk about and he'll get through it, I'm sure, if he decides that he wants to move out. So if we look at independence, clearly it does open those doors, doesn't it? And we, uh, we look at um, situations where we're employing individuals and a lot of times when I go to talk to people that I'm trying to um, kind of persuade to hire, even on a part-time basis, some of the guys in my therapy groups, they will say, how independent are they? Can they work without a lot of prompting? Can they, how long can they work without someone being right with them, right? Um, well, you know, I think they can probably work for a 15 minute stint. They're gonna need some reminders, maybe a coach or a coworker and a natural sort of uh, support. Uh, they're not real fast, I'll say. Or, you know, you may have to give them a visual schedule because they may not understand the language. Their cognition may be a little impaired. They're really fine with that. That part they're fine with. The thing they, they talk to me the most about is how independent, how much responsibility can they take on and how much supervision do they need. So again, a lot of these individuals will say, don't really care how fast they are, don't really care. Um, about their cognition uh, within reason. We just need them to be able to work independently. So again, that tells me that that's a pretty important goal for us all to take on. Again, um, if they don't need that one-to-one -one assistance and they don't need that prompting, then we look at them as having more opportunities and more independence, generally speaking. So that is a gift. That is a, a gift that we can give to these individuals as we're training them up and as we're parenting them. This is another individual that's in Ohio, and he has some advice to parents, which I think is pretty good advice. As you know, I lived at home basically all my life. Yeah. And I was always borrowing money from my mom and dad until I was 16 years old when I had to get my first job. So does this feel better? It feels better because I'm on, I have to learn to be on my own. I can't always depend on them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my dad's almost 70 years old. I mean, he's not, you know, he's going to be retiring soon. Then they'll want you to entertain him. And then they'll want me to entertain him. So you better get cracking on that, buddy. <laughs> I mean, they don't, I mean, he doesn't look 70, but, you know. But it's a fact. It's a fact. He's just. Yeah. He's, just, he's going to be 70 years old in three years. Yeah. And then just feeling better about being independent. It's got, it's got to feel better, doesn't it? Really? It feels better because I'm not dependent on them now. Mm -hmm. I'm not dependent on Paul and Nancy for money, for things to Exactly. Do. So again, he's saying it feels really good not to depend on mom and dad for everything, right? And this is at his work. We interviewed him there and he's, he was doing really well with that placement. So again, the doors open, the structure, the consistency, the expectations, that's why, what we use to build those skills. So again, just kind of thinking about how can I support these individuals to be more independent? What kinds of things can I give to them in terms of provisions so that I can kind of back off and not be on top of them all the time? Sometimes, the pro I mean, it happens sort of naturally because our resources are limited and we don't have a lot of people working as support carers, do we, all the time? And so when you have a group, you kind of have to make that work. And you have groups with various um, disabilities and various needs, and again, so that's sort of a natural sort of um, progression. I think giving up those fears, parents, I work with parents a lot about I'm the only one that can take care of this kid. I'm the only one that really understands this kid. That's hard. That's hard to give that up, right? Because it's, it's scary. But my point tonight is if you start to progress through this process and continue to have these expectations, it's going to be a lot easier in the long run. And you're going to be alive 
to have the gift of knowing that your child is going to be independent and okay when you're no longer around, right? So if you do it now while you're still here to see it and enjoy it and feel really comfortable with it, it's going to make a lot more sense in the long run. So this is kind of an interesting story. So now these are old TV shows that Mike watches and so he's going to put the characters into the gun smoke and also the Virginian. He's doing yep. a pretty good job of that. Oh yeah, that goes in gun smoke. Good for you, buddy. Yeah. Sorting them out. Yeah, that's correct. You know your people, that's for sure. And when you think about these cards, they're really very close in terms of pictures of yeah. cowboys, but he's able to discriminate. Okay, you got more to do, don't you? No. What are those for? Or did you look at that one? Okay, that goes there. You're right. So see, it's so fast, I don't even think he's looking. Okay, where did the rest go? You got it. So this is one of my gifts. Uh, this guy came to me a couple of years ago, and he was almost 70 years old. He is now. Fragile X, full mutation. Uh, parents are both dead. Uh, sister and brother are also dead. So this kind of left him in a bad position. He had some horrible behavioral outbursts. His dad was a physician, took really good care of him while he was alive, took him to his office. He talks about that kind of thing all the time, talks about his pony, talks about his bike, talks about the church he attended in Longmont, Colorado. And then when things started to kind of shift and parents got ill and became ill and, and then died, he was put in um, to the state home and training center that we have in our state, which I would say is not the very best place for anybody to have to live. Um, became very violent there, was really, um, I probably depressed. You know, these guys have feelings too. Just because they have disabilities doesn't mean that they don't have feelings about things. And I'm sure because he was Fragile X and connected so much, especially to his father, this was really hard for him. So um, his sister was still alive at that point, and he, she was advocating. She lived in Seattle, and she was advocating for him uh, to get out of that facility, and she worked really hard to make that happen. He then um, came to call, back to Colorado Springs, and he was in um, sort of a, a, what we call Cheyenne Mountain, which is community board um, that's kind of a, a support service where people can live and also people can work in the community and it's, it's just a big community service. And he lived in what we call host home. I don't know if you do anything like that, but it's individuals who will sort of take on the responsibility of taking in one of these individuals because they do better in a family sort of unit than in a group home. And so he was in kind of not so good a facility well, with somebody that wasn't really uh, connecting with him. And finally, the angels came and brought, <laughs> brought this wonderful couple who themselves are 80 right now, so they're not that much older or not that young, but um, taking great care and have included him in the family. And they do a little um, interview at the end. So this guy, they said, you know, he never read. He never learned to read because he wasn't in school systems. And, you know, he's old enough where we really weren't doing the special education like we do now. And so they said, but we think he can read because he's, whenever we make a grocery list and he loves to be a part of that and go with them and everything, and he's now in a wheelchair, so it's not an easy task, but they want to include him. And so the, he's reading the list and he tells us what's on our list. Oh, you forgot this? He'll scan the list and then he'll say, we still need orange juice. Those kinds of things. And I said, well, yeah, I've heard of this before. So we started, he, he was a news guy for the long, longest time. So we were picking out pictures of the people on TV that he would watch in the news. And we would put it with the right, like KKTV. And he knew exactly who were those sorts of people that, that were broadcasting for them. And he would sort those out. And I could start to feel this real, real pride in him. He was really, really happy that he was independent and able to do those things. And then we decided, well, you know, he watches a lot of TV. Let's see what he does with that. So we just went online and got these pictures of, of the old gun smoke, which the, the host mom says, I'm so tired of watching gun smoke, but whatever. Um, and so he started doing that and, and sorting those out. And then we started looking at food because I wanted him really to be able to do something functional with his reading. And so again, he started um, food sorting and putting uh, names and, and 
sorting out the visual vocabulary uh, so that he could then put those things on his list. So first we started with pictures and then we matched the words to the pictures and now he's using the words on his grocery list which you'll see at the end. So again somebody would say why in the world would you take time to teach a 70 year old how to read. Well, I think he already knew, and now what we're doing is confirming that with him and giving him lots of attaboys and saying, you know what, this is cool, Mike, you can read, can't you? Yeah, yeah, I can, I can. So again, it's, it's never too late is I guess my, my point in this. Um, as your kids age uh, out of high school and those services disappear, we know that some of that uh, school funding, as I said earlier, sort of disappears and we start to look for other ways to support these individuals. And it's not always easy because those community boards and their funding is limited as it is everywhere. And so again, those of you that are working in the field and continuing to support these guys, uh, I applaud you and, and I thank you because it's not an easy job and um, you're not in it for the money, that's for sure. Uh, at least in the States you're not and I would assume it's probably pretty much the same here. Um, so anyway, you have to kind of define the adult by a disability sometimes. That sort of feels yucky to me because uh, the more impaired they are, the more money that comes their way. We have tiers in the U.S. or in Colorado, I don't know if it's universal, uh, so that if you can check off a number of boxes and they come to the home and they say, yeah, he can't, he's not ambulatory like Mike. Uh, he can't, the ADLs are, are really loose, right? He's not doing a lot of those things by himself. He needs a lot of support. Well, then you get up to this sixth level of support and then there's more funding available. Do you do something similar to that here? Sort of? Yeah? Okay, sure. Same kind of thing. It's called actual disability insurance scheme for uh, special needs people. Uh-huh. And, and uh, I don't know about carers, but uh, it all depends the independence that they have. Do they need more resources? So yes. it might be more or less the same thing. Yeah, probably pretty close. And I guess if we were all really smart, we start this independence early on, right, and save the government some money. I mean, we could, we could look at it that way, right, and put the money in uh, at the beginning of time. So again, uh, but that, that happens um, for sure. And also, your role really changes as a parent or a caregiver when you're working with younger kids or even you're a paraprofessional in the school system. It changes a great deal because now you're really more responsible as a support carer uh, for community, for lots more having to do with ADLs because it's all day long instead of just at school. So what do you consider um, is, is, is really successful and helpful support at home? So again, I think it's the grooming. I think that's something that's really important. I think those um, capabilities that they have, you kind of pull out and capitalize on that. And so that becomes sort of the way you scaffold these skills. You encourage the time away uh, from home, where they are in community outings, becoming more and more independent away from home and doing things away from their support system that was their home. Um, you have to repeat these activities over and over again because these individuals tend to habituate sort of to a routine and that's really important for them to feel really comfortable when they get out in the community so they've done this over and over again and they can handle it much better. I think just fostering those relationships outside the family is important before they even leave the family, right? So that they have individuals that they're close to, they know people in the community, they can go on their way uh, to an activity, they know they're there. That's really very helpful. Um, so again, the hygiene I think is really important for sure and the dress and some of those things that are pretty easy to take care of right away. This guy is in Chicago and he's very proud of the fact that he now lives in a, a group facility that his parents and his aunt and uncle quite a few people put together and then the Jewish community funded it. So it's all private. Um, I think they may be getting into some um, public money soon uh, because they want to take kids that can't afford to pay it out of their own disability insurance. But they bought an apartment building and they converted it into apartments for individuals. Uh, I think five of the 10 have Fragile X syndrome and then others have different disabilities. 
but um, either they have their own apartment or they share an apartment with their own bath. So that's kind of cool. And this is Doug, who lives in that facility, and his parents um, sort of helped make this happen. And he's really proud of the fact that he's now shaving by himself kinda in his apartment. Kind of have to shave. Do you shave every day, or what um, do you do? I shave every single day. Yeah, it's hard for me. So first, you put on the shaving cream, it's right? Ju it's, it's Gillette. I've never had any poor Gillette shaver. Oh, a Gillette. Those are good. And and, and if you were See, like a, a, a regular blade. Sometimes. Is in, right by my work? Yeah. You were getting this cover card. Are you by my work? I think so. You were, you were, you were getting this cover card. Is that by, uh, Sam Jefferson and Cook? No, that's a different one. I think it's what are you at? I'm the one where, um, oh, I gotta see this. Does that hurt you to use that? No, shape? no, it doesn't. I just, I have oh, two, oh, actually. Oh. I have two. Okay. So it kind of scared me, honestly, to see him shaving, only because I know how distractible he is, right? And then there was another, the roommate was in there talking to me at the same time, right? And I'm trying to focus on Doug and give him all the yada boys, and then the other guy's needing some attention too. But he's very proud of that, and he said, my dad taught me how to do this, right? So he's got the razor blade. It's the Now, it's the razor, so it's not a razor blade per se, but I'm thinking, man. He did come out with a few nicks, I noticed, uh, after this. But again, that's kind of neat. Um, he's, he feels really good about what he's accomplishing and being more and more independent. It used to be that his dad kind of had to almost saddle him to shave him. <clears throat> and so now, knowing that he can do it by himself, it's kind of cool. Um, this, yeah, that's okay to take this one because the guy's back is to us. Uh, so you want to have, this is actually at that facility, so they have a common area where everybody can eat if they choose to. Um, it's also kosher, so that's kind of good for some of those individuals that need that to, to happen for them. And uh, they can cook in their apartments as well. So it's kind of this communal thing, or you can take some space away. And when I was there, we were trying to encourage more of that so that they could have people come into their apartment and maybe prepare some meals with the help of one of the providers and socialize a little bit better than just going down to that common area and kind of uh, just sort of hanging out. So again, uh, visual schedules, they use those uh, in a terrific way there. They structure the places so that there is a sensory break room there, even with adults. They also have a gym. I mean, it's a pretty cool place, I have to say. So they work that into their schedule, because some of them are overweight and they need to be working and getting their cardio up. Uh, then also leisure sites with different expectations. So it's not just like having um, a, a computer out and that you can just do whatever you want with it. They actually have for each person uh, scheduled in exactly what they need to do at the computer. So it's based on interests, and some of them will check scores, but they have to write down the scores or somehow um, call in somebody if they can't write down the scores and say, here's what it is, and they'll scribe for them. Uh, there are some that will take care of recipes and go on and, and find a recipe, and a lot of them for the Shabbat, they may be doing that. Uh, you know, cooking for, for this, providing the soup or something, and they have a new recipe for that. So it's really very cool um, what they're doing with that. They do limit the time on screens, and they have to have an expectation to be on those screens. And we know that happens, doesn't it? They kind of just all kind of gravitate sometimes to those screens. And we started early on because it's a great babysitter, and I hate to admit it, but I think we've all probably done that. Um, so again, uh, breaking that uh, down, I think also just having some small things to do, even though some of them go out on a community in this particular facility, go out in the community, others have jobs. So again, if they don't have a work job, sometimes just creating a small job, and again, this is something um, up in the, in the upper left, uh, the guy in um, New Mexico is helping to assist at kind of a, um, Oh, it's a soup kitchen. So again, that's something that they can do and, and they provide that opportunity so they can give to others in a way to feel really good about themselves as well. And they really talk about that. That's, that's really pretty cool. And the next one on the other side is a family member. And uh, again, he loves playing cards. He's a shark and uh, he beats us every single time. So that's just part of kind of having those kinds of things that are part of their skill set that makes them feel more independent and more like an adult would feel. So how does this fit? How do we link this from the inside out? That's basically my way of getting into neurobiology of those individuals with Fragile X syndrome and how we kind of have to adapt 
uh, things and strategies to work with them. I don't know, Wendy, it's pretty warm in here, isn't it, guys? Or, yeah, no? Yeah. We might, can we leave that door open? It got that way last night, yeah, so nice. I could take my jacket off too. So, some of the things that come with the territory of Fragile X Syndrome is problems sleeping, problems with delayed uh, toileting and being independent, uh, eating, um, grooming and hygiene, motor delays, those things that we all know uh, can cause some problems. And of course, the behavior can kick in at any time. We know that these guys have this thing called hyperarousal and um, they can become so anxious that then they sort of flow off the top and there's not much you can do to calm them down but to let them go through that cycle and then to, um, at the end of it, go through it with them in terms of let's remediate this, let's talk about why uh, this happened and let's see if we can figure out a way to um, make it not be so prevalent in the future. Um, we also know that they're very, very social, but they don't always have the skills that they need to be effective socially. So again, the structure for sleep, you guys know about this, but I'm going to just say it again. Um, you know, consistent bedtime, and you do have those um, opportunities, I think, in um, group facilities where you kind of have that laid out as this is when we all kind of you know, wind down and this is sleep time and then maybe a bedtime routine, it may be a shower, it may be a bath, um, it may be in the morning, it may be in the evening, it may be every other day, it may be every day, but those are the things that you want to kind of um, get together for sure um, and, and really structure in a way that they can depend on it. Visual schedules work for older people too. Um, I always tell people say, well he knows his schedule and I don't really need to provide it. Well, Visual schedule could be a picture, but it could also be a written um, schedule in terms of just written words, right? And you can do it on the run. You don't have to have anything really perfect from board maker or something like that. You can just write it down. You can put it on little sticky notes. You can do it a number of different ways just to help them have that little extra support. This is what we're doing now. We found with kids with Fragile X and adults as well, it doesn't, they don't grow out of the need to have the structure, right? And so again, you're at a point where, yeah, oftentimes, if they just have that little extra um, feel of, oh, this is what I'm doing next, it sort of settles them in, and suddenly now they can get through the structure of that particular situation. Many times, their talk will tell you that they want to know what's next, that they don't know what's next. And then, and then, and then, whenever I get a kid like that, an adult like that too, just tells me they're anxious, about what's happening next because they want to keep asking that, you know. Or they may ask the same question over and over. When we're finished, what do we do? What time do we finish? When, when do we finish? What do we do? And you know the speech of those with Fragile X, it's that continuous sort of repetition again for that reassurance. And I found that oftentimes if you just have that sticky note and you can have that put up there so that they can look at that and know, and of course my drawings are not great, but I've been known to have to draw a little stick figure when I couldn't print something off the computer because it was a quick and dirty sort of a, uh, need, I would do my best and it seems like it still worked. So quiet rooms, sometimes they share rooms, of course, with a roommate, and again, you have to work that out because there are some individuals who don't want to wear headsets, don't want to wear earbuds because of their sensory issues, right? So that's a little bit tough when they're saying they want to listen to music at night. I really try to, with all kids, kids that I see, and I'm not the most popular person uh, for, this, for this reason, uh, I like to cut the screens early in the evening because we know that stimulates our brains and it really does keep them sort of going, I think. And uh, so we have a certain time where I ask parents to have the screens in their bedroom or somewhere uh, where they need to keep it and um, hopefully then there's a good time for bedtime without a lot of screens or a lot of stimulation, visual stimulation. Uh, night lights, we sometimes recommend the, night, uh, the lights that um, start to sort of dim gradually and then are off at a certain time and in the morning same thing. It's kind of like daylight so it starts to get a little bit lighter and then by the time that they're supposed to wake up it's completely bright. Uh, sharper image, we have that in the States, I don't know if you do, but that's, that's a really good uh, resource. Um, the music, again, as long as it's not getting in the way, um, and then again, sound machines. A lot of times that will sort of filter out any of those additional noises that these guys, and I'm talking adults, 
this helps adults as well. Uh, it's not just baby monitors and those kinds of things. Okay, so the toileting. This can become a major issue, and even when we're trying to place individuals and get jobs for them. Uh, what we know about this is some individuals have problems with toileting, but what it tends to be is just difficulty wiping because the toilet paper is kind of, uh, it, it really bothers them in terms of the sensory feedback that they're getting from toilet paper and so oftentimes we use the wipes or something like that. We need to start assisting them to get them independent and even if they're adults it's a little embarrassing but guess what? In the long run if they're smelling or they're in a facility where people are saying oh you know we can't have him around individuals because or even our, our customers because of the fact that he really does smell um, then we have to work on that because it's going to cut them out of the opportunity to be independent and work where they need to work. So once again, really working on that I think is really important and it's not the greatest job in the world. I understand that. One time I was assisting a young man who was about 16 and I was really tired of washing out his underwear. It was getting old fast, right? Um, and once you get to a certain age, not to be too graphic, things start to smell really bad. And so I'm really upset with Jamal and I'm going after it and all of a sudden he looks up and he says, I really like your eyeshadow. And I thought I was gonna have to just fall, fall on my rear end at that point because that was so funny. I was so irritated, but you know, that's the gift they give us, isn't it? So at that point in time, I couldn't be too upset with, with him after all. Um, so again, kind of gives that negative feeling, that intolerance that our culture has around um, that, that problem. Uh, let's just schedule time. Let's try to assist um, so that the wiping can happen. Uh, wet wipes, sometimes the ones that are flushable work better because it feels better. Uh, the sensory feedback for them is, is better for them. Um, so again, nice underwear sometimes will help. Um, fragrant soap gel, washes for showering, those kinds of things. So again, um, that, that seems to be something that you have to really work on. And just to let you know, that's pretty normal for the population. Now, eating is a big deal because what happens with eating is that early on, our guys really like carbs, foods that are easy sort of to their mouth, right? Because they have the same sensory issues going on inside their mouth. And so because these are such poor receptors inside, oftentimes they'll stick their finger in there or they'll even need to really fill their mouth totally full before they get the feedback, see? And that's part of the pleasure of eating. We get feedback in our mouth. Well, that's not working so well for them or certain textures really um, don't feel good. And like meat, a lot of them like a steak or something that's sort of hard uh, texture-wise, they don't necessarily eat at the very beginning of time. Uh, one guy said to me, I don't know why you really wanted to teach him to eat meat because now all he wants when we go out is a steak or at home he wants a steak and they're really expensive. So uh, anyway, he, those things kind of just don't happen for them and they don't like all textures and so what does that do? When they're adults, they really have been used to eating lots of carbs, right? They crave the carbs and you sort of like give in to it when they're growing up because again, it's pleasuring your child. It's something they like, they don't ask a lot of you, right? Um, and so you wanna give them something they like. And so what happens with that is that we often have individuals who are pretty obese, um, their, their diets are limited, they don't like salads. Um, a lot of the females with Fragile X, um, yeah, tell me, that's rabbit food. I don't eat that stuff, you know? <laughs> so again, you know, the good nutrition sort of gets lost because of some of those sensory issues. And then when they're adults, we have adults obsessed over food. They truly obsess over food. And Doug that was shaving, um, he broke into his cousin's apartment uh, to get a loaf of bread because <laughs> he knew he had it in the freezer. It was even frozen. So, I mean, that's pretty bad, right? And they got it on camera, and um, the parents decided, you know what, We're gonna, we want the police called. We really do, because even though this is in our little contained sort of apartment building that we own and whatever, we think he needs to understand you can't do that. You couldn't go out on the street and break into somebody's home for food. But it sort of just gives you, and you, you heard him, he's pretty high functioning. Uh, he was shaving, he could have a conversation with me, but he's obsessed over food, and so, the problem was they were limiting too much 
in terms of what he was eating. And so he became so much obsessed with it. It's like anybody. We have to kind of do that carefully, don't we? And so again, what he's doing now is he's ha he has alternative nights um, where he eats an alternative to what's being served. And they do this with everyone. So they'll say, you know what? Um, because you eat kosher, um, you have an alternative tonight, right? So you can always pick the alternative and here's what we've made or what we have. And they try not to make it like this wonderful, okay, this big burrito that everybody's going to want to eat. And then the alternative is this awful vegetarian dish that tastes terrible, you know. So you want to make it fair in terms of the choice, but you're trying to teach them some healthy eating habits. And Kyle, who was interviewed uh, early on, also has had that problem. And so they started dividing up his uh, snacks, and they made them really healthy snacks. Well, he didn't like how much they were putting in the baggie, you know, in the plastic bag, and so he had a fit. Um, those are things that are really important to them that they want to control, and yet we have to somehow help them understand that we have to cut that back because it's a health issue. And I think that's the main thing. We can't get off on, you know, well, you weigh this much or whatever, and Doug's kind of obsessed with that too, because I think as parents, we can say too much of that. We can say, you know, you need to lose 10 pounds. Well, that's not easy for any of us, frankly, unless you're as big as Liz. <laughs> Sorry, Liz, but I found out today Liz doesn't like sugar, so that explains the whole thing, right? <laughs> But anyway, I think we have to be sort of careful about how we limit that, but also to be really happy uh, when once a week they go and weigh or they see a nutritionist and they've lost some weight. So that's something, again, that we need to, to really reinforce. Um, and I think eating slowly, these are the guys, again, that like to stuff so that they can get that sensation in their mouth. And eating slowly will help them get the message to their brain that they actually are full when they, long before they think they are, right? Okay, so um, we've talked this through, I think, pretty much, oftentimes overweight. Here's the other problem, low muscle tone. So that means you don't really like to exercise, you don't have a, a good motor planning, um, so that you really, it's very difficult to use your body in a way that can be effective in terms of burning up calories. And so, like at, at the place in Chicago that I talked about, they do have a workout room, and that is part of the schedule, and it works beautifully. So they go in, and they have to walk on the treadmill for so many minutes, uh, and then they check back in, and that's part of their schedule, and then they go on to the next. It really does work because it's just part of their, you know, it's like a non-negotiable. It's just part of their day. So again, I think some of those things um, are really important. That obsession, uh, one of the things that we know about chewing is that it's a calming mechanism, right? Um, so, <laughs> so anyway. Oh yeah, right, exactly. That's exactly right. So they'll bite and chew, won't they, to calm themselves. Eating serves the same purpose. Yep. Yep, there you have it. Mm -hmm. That's a very that's very common. You see this a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And so then we say, okay, at least he's not chewing his hoodie, but then he's eating food all the time, right? To chew. So it's tough. It's really tough, isn't it? But again, we think part of that is his their need to kind of self calm. Okay, so that chewing and eating uh, kind of factors into that as well. Grooming. We really have to work on this because. Our society is one in which we accept people who are clean, who look well-groomed. And when we're trying to place these individuals in the community or even have them accept it, accepted in the community, we're really putting them out there to be ridiculed if we're not teaching them these things. You know, whether it's right or wrong, it's the societal norm, and we have to pay attention to that. The other thing is dress, dressing age appropriately. We know our guys and a lot of our, our females with Fragile X just hate tight-fitting jean dockers, anything like that. They like sweats because they're soft and they're able to wear the, the sweats. And so that's okay. But again, um, maybe wearing something that's uh, My Little Pony. And I know that's now, I've, I've heard this from my typically neurotypical guys. You know, that's a game we play and it's this and that. But sometimes the girls are still wearing those uh, sweatshirts that they get places and they're 30 years old and they're wearing a My Little Pony. You know, we have to, sweatshirt, we have to kind of think about that. So what are you gonna, what are you gonna think? Let's be really honest. Men. 
So if we see somebody who's an adult and they're wearing a kindergarten type jersey, right, or, or sweatshirt, what's the first thing you think? Now I know we are more accepting individuals and we work with these guys, but seriously, we're going to think, hmm, maybe that person is cognitively impaired. Maybe that person uh, has something wrong with them. It's a judgment call. I understand none of us like to admit that, but it's true. And so let's do something to help them out. Let's do everything we can to make them more viable to our communities, right? And these are easy fixes. I mean, we can't get inside their brain and, and fix that piece of them all the way around, but we can help them be more presentative. Pre pre OK, I'm going to stop again because I have jet lag. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so presentable, you know, just really kind of, OK, you're OK. You look sort of, you kind of fit with everybody else that's your age. So again, that's something that we have to think about. And in our communities, let's really try, parents and carers, to make sure that that's available to these individuals. OK, grooming. Um, that goes along with this, doesn't it? Hygiene and grooming. The haircuts. Now, this is tough because these individuals don't like things touching their head. They don't like shampoo. They don't like going to the hairdresser to get a haircut. Um, the even shaving sometimes is tough, and a lot of my guys have beards because they just don't like to mess with it, right? Uh, so you're kind of bumping, bumping up against the neurobiology. That's why we call this from the inside out. There's so many problems that present due to that darn gene. And so you, you kind of have to work around that. You have to look at some of them love showers. Some of them are scared to death of that water coming down on them. Uh, some would rather bathe. You just have to figure out what the best, best is for them. And so the reason I'm sharing this is if they're having a fit when it's time to groom, you can't just assume they just don't want to groom. They just don't want to take the time away from their device. They don't want to take the time away from X, Y, and Z. That's probably true for a reason, okay? It's the neurobiology. It is really scary for them to have to feel shampoo or soap on their body or on their hair. And not everyone. But it's, it's something that we find often in this population, girls included. Women are included in that. And so again, you're sort of working against that neurobiology. And yes, there's a behavioral episode that probably follows. But if we sort of look at what the cause is, I don't look at it as an excuse. I look at it as, as a real cause. It's, it's really who they are. So again, we have to work on that. We have to figure out ways to desensitize them to that process, right? And to help them understand that this is really important for them and to be accepted. Uh, so choices regarding when, the sh when to shower, when you brush your teeth, those help. Um, also remembering some of those spin brushes that all our dentists are, are recommending, sensory overload a lot of times to our guys, right? And, and the girls too too much. It's too much input. And so just the regular tooth brushing is the way you have to go because if you're going to say it's either the spin brush and no brushing or the one that you're just doing manually and at least we get some brushing going on, I think we have to choose, don't we, what's going to give them the best dental hygiene. And then again, um, just maybe giving them a choice, letting them kind of make those choices. They're forced choices. We call them forced choices because both of them is okay but they feel like they've got some control over it. And we all like that, right? We all need to have some choices. So again, um, that's, that's important. This is kind of a neat little deal that, um, that one of the parents came up with. And I, I really like it because she was having a lot of trouble um, just getting her son to independently wash. And so again, she, she provided this to me and said, share it with everyone. So they just hang it in the, in the bathroom. And she's got this unbelievable laminator that laminates. It, it's like plastic almost. So it works in a shower. Um, and she has replaced it several times. But as he you know, sh showers and kind of scrubs his head, she moves that piece over so it's done. So that's why I'm kind of showing you how half and half. It's a really nice system because he can now independently do those things, right? She doesn't, and you know, like she said, he's 14. I don't want to be washing his body. That doesn't work for me. She's a single mom. There's no guy in the, in the house. So, you know, she wants to be sure that he 
starts to do this on his own. And so again, let's do this, Logan, moves it over, okay? He's got it. Okay, now we're going to do this, all right? And as he sees it visually and moves it, it makes it work for him because he's more independent again. See, it's a buy-in because he can do it independently. It's really, really cool. Okay, so now um, I want to show you Mike doing his grocery list. Yes. Okay, you need juice today? Okay, put that on your grocery list. What else did you tell me you needed? You need bacon? Okay, what yeah. else? Something about coffee stuff. Do you need <coughs> cookies? No. Well, then don't put them on there. If you don't need cookies, <coughs> don't no. put them there. Just what you need. Okay. What are you out of? Yep, creamer. You told me that. Okay. Yeah. What else? I don't know. That's it? That's it. Okay, and I don't know is the go-to all the time, and now he knows that I don't accept that, right? So I kind of poke at him. And when he says, I don't know, then he smiles at me because he knows he's in trouble. <laughs> it's just too funny. So, okay, he had told me ahead of time some of these things needed. And these are kind of the go-tos almost every week that they buy. So there's some pretty predictable sorts of choices, and I'm sure they buy other things. So now we're going out in the waiting room, and these are the wonderful people that have provided him a fabulous home and lots of love and attention. And, and let's talk about your grocery list. Guys, is this what we need, do you think, from the grocery store? Uh, yes, it is. We talked. We made a grocery list this morning, didn't we, Mike? Yeah. So we included all of those things, plus a couple more. Okay, good. So you remembered, Mike. That's good. Yeah. So now you have your grocery list and you know what to get, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. That's perfect. Okay, so that um, kind of shows you how to make that functional, right, in terms of, of that particular list making and those kinds of things so that he feels, and he loves going to the grocery store. So Thursday is the day he sees me, and um, they always go to the grocery store afterwards. So the first they see me, then they go to lunch because that's a favorite thing for him to do, and he gets to pick where they're going, and he always has to have some money in his pocket because um, he pays the tip oftentimes. So again, it's real important to him to contribute, and it's real important for him to do those kinds of things um, with, the, with the family. And those are things that they talked about for sure, and that's something that um, he wants to do. So again, I think that I have... Okay, so when we look at neurobiology again, motor delays, that comes in early on. And these guys, it's so difficult for them because they often want to write. They want to write their name. They want to participate. And especially when they're a guy and they're not doing any sports or anything like that because the motor planning is so difficult, they're low muscle tone, they're just not into that normally, it becomes difficult. So in development and then figuring out leisure skills, okay? But there's one thing they love to do and they do well. Bowling. Do you guys have bowling here? Yeah? Yay. Okay, that's universal then. I like that. <laughs> yeah, it's unbelievable. So here they are. Um, this is Kyle, and he's going bowling with a bunch of his, his friends, and they always can come then into group therapy and talk about their scores and brag about that and, and be totally um, cool about a sport that they really enjoy. And then he works out. He goes in and uh, has a gym that he goes to that they give the group a, a rate on and they can go in and work out. And so again, you can see the dramatics. He's really into it, right? Ah, man. Now that's probably the only lift he did the whole time, but that's okay. But it looked good for the picture. They also really enjoy Special Olympics. And I've had parents say to me, I don't want, he's in special ed, I don't want him to do special Olympics because that's another one of those special things that puts him with all these kids that are disabled and all these kinds of things. And well, okay, that's all right. If you don't want him in that, that's fine. But really what happens is that they then generally, um, as they're adult, and they want to do something with a, a group or they want to be you know, physically active, um, they, they really do participate in Special Olympics. And so these are two guys with Fragile X that have earned medals. And believe me, they are so happy about that. I mean, they've got them hanging around, and, you know, that's really important. That's sort of their showcase for their achievements. And again, gives them an opportunity to be with other individuals, to socialize. Those are the things that come with Special Olympics. So I'm all for it. 
Uh, this is Kyle when they took the state championship, and you can see how happy he was. He's with the group at, uh, also that was uh, uh, on his graduation, and he stayed in school as we do in the States till through the age of 21. Uh, so you get services then, and he was older than the rest of the guys, but it was fine. Um, he was really happy about it. Like I said, he wears his two rings. They're huge, um, and he's, he's proud of that. So again, what does that tell us? I mean, they have to be happy and proud of things they've accomplished, right? And the only way to do that is to help him become independent because he could not be the coach's assistant if he had to have now a paraprofessional following him around What's that worth, right? I mean, that, that's not really being an assistant. So again, it's really important for us to provide that opportunity to these individuals. We also know that behavior plays a big part in this group, okay? They're not easy sometimes. And they can be upset and they can, something can trigger that we don't even, can't even imagine what it was, right? So they've accumulated maybe some infraction, something that happened earlier in the day, yesterday, and they kind of start to accumulate, right? And now we're like, I don't get it. This was something he would talked about. He's looking forward to. And all of a sudden, we're getting a meltdown, right? Well, this guy is a guy that um, was at a high school. He was 21. And um, this is a real high-achieving uh, high school. So he's in special education in this high-achieving sort of, anyway, uh, high school. So they did not like the fact that he pulled the fire alarm all the time and they were missing out on their college prep and going to Stanford or somewhere that's a, a great school in the States. I'm being facetious. So um, this is kind of what happened first and why he got to this point. Uh, Mom had to transport him because he could no longer... So she's trying to act like she's not attending, but it's not easy. So this can happen to you when you take these individuals into the community. We know this, right? We've all lived it pretty much. Okay, it's pretty rough. And this is a mom. So she kind of, okay, this is my kid. What if it's a group of kids and you're the, the carers, the support workers, and everybody's looking at you like, do something about this, and they're calling 911, and they're calling the police, whatever it is, and you've got to figure out how to, how to get this kid in a better place. And he's an adult, but everybody's a kid to me now because I'm an old lady. Um, it's hard, isn't it? And again, with Fragile X individuals, the more we react, the more they react. It's right through, they can feel it right through their skin. So even if we're trying to be calm and our face is calm and our words are calm and our intonation kind of neutral, they know that something is wrong. And what we also know about their behavior is because they think in this gestalt global way, um, learning things visually as a whole, that they have this behavioral cycle that they have to complete before they can be done with it, okay? So it has to go through this cycle, and at the end, they start to cry, they feel really bad, they're rueful, they say they're sorry, but if you interrupt that at the beginning of that or during that cycle, then they continue to habituate. And I'm not saying you have to do this every time because sometimes you have to intervene if somebody's going to get hurt. But for the most part, if you can, when we have those meltdowns, you need to pull them away so they're safe and you're safe and they have to go through that cycle. If you're in the community and you're at a point where I don't know what to do, right? Um, there's a problem here. Again, get a coworker, stay safe. Do not give attention. They're not going to hear any redirect at that point because they're hyper aroused and they're over the top. And so giving them, you're okay, it's all right, that's just going to agitate them, okay? And that's a normal instinct, isn't it? We're trying to calm them down. We're trying to soothe them. So it's better if you just are very quiet, don't say anything, make sure they're safe, make sure you're safe. Now what I would do then after that point is I certainly would take note of any antecedent that you think may have sparked that. Now, we don't always think of this um, in, a, in a real logical way, but there could be something very small that they might even repeat later on and give you a clue to, or there could have been a change that you thought, oh, 
Why didn't I think of that? I mean, I've done this a million times. Why didn't I think of that? That's right, we made that change and I didn't even think of it. No wonder, because change is a big deal to these guys. We see it more prevalent in this population than even the autism spectrum disorder. Uh, so again, that's something that you really have to pay attention to. Any change, it could be subtle, it could be something that you think is a good change. You might think it was something that was really exciting and happy and wonderful. It could be a change in personnel. It could be a change in the direction that you're driving that day because the street is closed. And again, we can't change the world for these guys, of course not. But just to kind of put that into perspective. So what I would suggest, let's say you're on your way and you're driving and oh my gosh, they've changed the route and I've got to go this way, it's going to take longer. So you start a side dialogue with the person that's in the car with you. They will hear every word of a side dialogue because they're nosy. But if you'd say to them, you know, Kyle, oh, Kyle, we're going to have to go a different way or whatever, that's going to immediately raise their anxiety and they're going to suddenly be hyper aroused. If you're talking to somebody and they're overhearing it, they will hear every word of it and it'll be an indirect sort of message, okay? So you're gonna, oh, it looks like they've closed this road. I think we'll probably go, pretty soon they'll chime in and say, you're gonna go down Drake instead? They're cool, they're cool with it. So that's a really good strategy that works a lot. Parents, you can do it with each other or with another sibling of, of this person. Whatever you need to do to kind of give them that indirect when we're teaching them, we talk about a triad. We talk about that indirect instruction. So you instruct this other guy, and here's your kid with fragile X, and he's not going to respond to any direct question because it makes him too anxious and he gets hyper aroused. You're going to ask this kid a question, and he's going to answer it for you. <laughs> so that's just the way it works with them, right? Um, so again, I think we need to understand we have this phenotype that we discuss all the time related to this gene. We have ADHD, which makes things very interesting, doesn't it? And a lot of times they're on medication, um, but they really have a hard time with focus, concentration. So if you're trying to sort of get them into a job opportunity, uh, you're going to have to habituate, habituate the skill. You're going to have to teach it over and over again, and they're going to have to have that kind of repeated exposure in order to get through this. Sometimes they're compulsive, sometimes they're repetitive, but that's also a good thing because we've put some kids into those repetitive jobs that nobody else wants to do and they love it. You know, if you're anxious and you're a little OCD, it's kind of nice to have that repetitive, something you can count on all the time, sort of calming. Takes one to know one. Um, strong reaction to changes in the routine, yeah, that's a big deal. So again, looking ahead and if you're in a situation where it happens, because that's going to happen and you haven't planned it out, start your side dialoguing. Start a way through that so that you can give that message in an indirect way. And then the hyperarousal, um, they're really inconsistent with the regulation of their emotions. And so it doesn't take much for them to go over the top. We have a lot of mood disorders, individuals um, with fragile X who are adults. Again, uh, the girls. Um, oftentimes, we have mood disorders with them, bipolar disorder, we have depression. Um, this is something that happens quite frequently in that population. Probably know more about it with the girls. Maybe it's not more prevalent in the girls, but because they can tell us about it, right? They can have the language they're less affected, and they can tell us, and the boys or the men will kind of act it out, okay? They'll show us their behavior in a different way. The women oftentimes have panic attacks. Um, it's very scary. Because if anybody's had one of those, um, it's no fun, is it? Um, and you, you start to think you're dying, that you're going to have a heart attack. Um, cold water, ice water, that, that kind of thing calms them down. Medication often is, is necessary. So again, when they start that rapid breathing and that pulse and they're thinking something's really wrong, you're gonna, they're, they're going to, to really um, you know, be afraid. Be afraid that they're having a heart attack. So again, those things are prevalent as well. Um, that approach avoidance issue, okay? We've all been there, right? So we're going to plan something and you know they're going to love it. And you get to the car and they're not going with you, okay? And it's like, wait a minute, I don't get this. How come he doesn't want to go? We've been talking about it for a week, right? And all of a sudden, he doesn't want to go. So it's all about that, I approach it and then I avoid it. I approach it, I avoid it. Crossing a threshold, another transition. Why don't they want to go on the other side of the door? 
because they don't know what's on the other side of the door. They don't know what the expectation is. They don't know if they leave one room and go somewhere else and they're unfamiliar with it, um, what's, what's it going to look like to them. And so again, those transitions are really, really hard for them. And you see that approach avoidance oftentimes. Um, a lot of worrying. They'll tell you that in sort of this repetitive sort of language. So they'll start to talk and you'll see what they're worried about, okay? Going, Going to go to the lab tomorrow. Going to get the blood done. Going to go to the lab tomorrow. Going to go to the lab. We're going to the lab tomorrow, Mom. We're going to the lab. That's the language, right? And you hear it over and over again. That's what they're worried about. They're also the ones that say, as I said earlier, and then, and then, and then, and then. What they're saying to you is, I want to know what the schedule is. I want to know what we're doing next. And then after that, and then after that. So again, they tell us what they need. And it's our job to figure it out, right? I mean, they clearly are communicating. It's maybe not in an adaptive way, but we can make that adaptive for them. We can help them be more adaptive based on their behavior, their language, those kinds of things. So some of the males um, respond with higher rates of aggression, more outbursts. It's a conundrum. Um, some of them are really hard to deal with in adolescence and puberty, and then all of a sudden they're just a cakewalk. They're really easy to deal with. They're wonderful to have around. The only problem is sometimes they become a little reclusive. As they get older, they want to sort of be in their rooms more. They don't want to go out. Some of them become agoraphobic, so we have to be careful about that. Um, and that's just because when you think it, well, my take on it, I don't have any research to support this, but my take from a million years of clinical uh, experience is that when they're in school and there's structure and there's expectations, there's always something to do, they kind of follow that routine, they habituate to it. As they grow older, the routine changes, and if they're not kept busy in the community or don't have a job, they tend to pull back and become more and more reclusive because it's real easy to do. So again, um, that's, that's some of the problems. Um, also, they take longer sometimes, a certain subset of this, this group um, takes longer to self-calm, to get sort of down to a better uh, level to, to manage. So again, we desensitize. There's a way to uh, decrease uh, some of those fears, get them through those times of intensity in terms of behavior. If we need to desensitize them, that's just an easy thing to do related to, okay, we're going to kind of take those steps, right, to kind of desensitize. So the first thing we're going to do is you're going to carry this tray over to the next room, or maybe you're going to carry some balls into the gym, or maybe you're going to take our workout uh, equipment into the gym. It's a way to kind of think about the job, get over the threshold, and then they're, they're in a better place. So it desensitizes them to that worry about, what am I going to do? What am I supposed to do? Where do I go? Whatever, okay? If they have a job and we know they love to be cooperative, they love to help, it's kind of getting their, them, their attention on that. Again, um, opportunities to de-escalate. Uh, and really, we have to reduce that input. So that is not the time to start talking to them about what they need to change in their behavior or ways that they could get through this episode. Okay. Um, let's see. I want to. I want to leave enough time for questions. So what I think I'll do is, in terms of the treatment, let's be really clear and direct um, in terms of predictions. Let's use those schedules. Let's do task assignments so that they know what they're doing next, make it part of their job. Um, I think those kinds of things override those, those fears that are created because they don't know what's happening next or it's a new experience. Um, this is approach avoidance. I just want to show this quickly to you because it's going to show you what that input does when somebody's already hyper aroused and over the top. And it's his mom, and she's trying really hard. But it's sort of like, let's make a deal. So he doesn't want to get out of the car. Uh, uh, uh. Come on, Michael, get out. Sorry. So do I see a beast? Take this one, Paul. Huh? Darn, Sue. Come on, I'll help you get out. Sure, no, no. Huh? Uh. Come on. Sorry. Oh, that be nice and huge. They're cooking hamburgers. Oh, I'm full. Oh, oh. You wanna ride the bulldozer? You fucky, fucky shit. Fuck, fucky shit. 
I've got a lawn chair up there for you. Get your hands out of the coke. So, we don't need to see any more of this. We've done it, right? We've been there. Try to coax them. Try to get them out of the car. He's at his grandpa's. He loves his grandpa. He loves doing things with his grandpa. And all of a sudden, he's just shutting down. What do we do in those situations? Any ideas? Yep? Excuse me? <laughs> well, or take the keys out of the car and walk away. I mean, you're right there. How many of you have had good luck with that, where you turn and sort of walk away and they follow you? It usually works pretty well. Yeah, it usually works pretty well. And then you don't turn around and say, oh, I'm glad you're coming with me, because mm -mm, then they're going to go back to the car again, right? So uh, just kind of walk away, um, and they follow you. So again, that input at that point, he's into that approach avoidance. He wants to, but he's afraid to. For some reason, who knows, he's been there a lot. You know, he's been to grandpa's, he loves grandpa. They do all kinds of neat things with grandpa. But for some reason, at this particular juncture, he doesn't want to get out of that car. And so again, um, sort of leave him alone, right? And maybe walk away, really slow walk, turn your back. Usually it works pretty well. So she's giving him too much input, and at that point in time, she's probably making things worse by trying to make things better for him. Like I said, we've all done it. So again, they tell us what they, what they need, and they have these behaviors. Um, they have all of this neurobiological underpinning that sort of causes them to react a certain way. So going back to this episode where he doesn't want to get out of the car, you see what's going on here. Um, that response from that parent sort of cements in a response pattern, right? So again, he knows every time she's going to try to talk him out of it, come on, you know, you can, you can get out of the car, talk him into it, whatever it is. So that's now becoming part of this behavioral episode. So he's going to expect that from her every time because that's how she reacts when he doesn't have anything to do with, with the directive um, or ignores it. So if she turns her back and walks away, she's broken that behavioral cycle because he's not going to get what he expects to get in those situations, which is conjoling, trying to get um, you know, some buy-in from him. Come on, you can do this. They're doing this. They're having burgers. They've got a lawn chair. All of that stuff, you turn around and walk away. You've broken that cycle. And that's your opportunity then to build in a new behavioral system. So again, your response sort of solidifies that. And um, that causes some, some major issues. So again, how do you respond? If you respond in a way that's going to continue, um, in a way that continues the behavior, you know you're doing it wrong, so you break that cycle. Um, dealing with that physical and emotional hurt is a hard one because they hit us. And I don't know, moms, um, if you've been hit by your kids, it's not fun. Um, you, yours does not hit. Good. He's more scared of me than he's me. All right, we're going to hire you. <laughs> well, some of them are, and it's hard because you've given everything in the world to these guys, right? And then they hit you or they hurt you. You have to talk about it. You have to decompress. You have to have a chance to sort of talk to your sister, to your, to your mom, to a friend, whatever, because it's okay to say, you know what? This really bugs me. I do all this for this kid, and he hurts me. You know, I don't get it. Why do I keep getting that kind of feedback? Staff, same, same thing. I mean, you're human, right? I mean, I know that you're, you're in a different position, but when they hurt you, it's really hard not to sort of be afraid or to kind of hold that against them. So again, it's really important, and I know you, you probably do this all the time. You go through and you have sort of those debriefings that are really important. So I'm going to skip to the end of this um, because I really think it's important for you to hear this video um, of the individuals who are the host family. And again, I'm sorry, but I, I never know quite how long these are going to go. And so um, this is just behavioral supports for a guy. We've uh, developed sort of a chart for him. We've actually used his favorite characters and TV characters to um, show us when he's worried or for him to choose those things and express those things. And then what can he do instead of worrying? He might choose music, um, whatever. Uh, it's just a really nice personalized attempt, sort of um, give him a chance to 
um, express his, his feelings. So the anxiety we've talked about, it really is difficult. The hyperarousal, they're over the top. They get, um, you know, this, this modulation that's not working for them. And what we know happens is then they're trying to clean up a mess over and over again, and the water just keeps pouring out of the pitcher. So it just doesn't work. We have to figure out ways for them um, to calm down. We have strategies that help them. Um, predictability is one, for example. Having the schedules there is one. Social stories, a great way to help individuals with Fragile X as their adults to read those social stories, read to them, let them know what happened. So you state the problem and you use their name and then you go forward to the next sentence or the body of the, the social story in which you're kind of saying um, what went wrong. So the problem kind of what went wrong, a little more detail, and then the end of it is a resolution for them. The next time when you're at the grocery store, you're going to walk forward with the cart instead of pulling off things from the, you know. So you give them a little bit of hope. Um, this is what's the good, good ending to the story, and it gives them then an opportunity to process a resolution. Oh, gosh, guys. Oh, my goodness. I want to I wanna leave us time. So let me just go forward. Am I going backwards? It looks like I am. Um, this is the social compass program that we have, and Wendy has purchased some so that that's going to be available um, for the group. And also, if you want to purchase, great. Um, it's really just teaching uh, appropriate social behaviors and grooming and hygiene and sexual, navigating sexual situations because they are sexual beings. Um, many of them do have relationships. Many of them marry. And so again, um, it's something that's very important. Uh, we don't want them to be exploited, so we want them to be very clear on what's a public behavior, what's a private behavior, who the public people are and who the private people are, and matching that behavior with in the bathroom, uh, in your bedroom you masturbate, but you don't do that in a public setting. So that doesn't, masturbation is private. It goes in a private facility or room. It does not happen in the community because it doesn't match up. So it's very black and white. It's all visual because that really works for these individuals. Their visual cognition is very strong. So that's part of that. It also includes uh, video vignettes. <gasps> So um, the guy in the background, it's a really neat story, he has five siblings that have fragile X. Some are carriers and some have full mutation. He's the only one that didn't get the gene. So again, um, he did this because he, he has a company um, and uh, an acting company and produces lots of different, um, different theater events in Denver. And he said, I'll do this for you. So the idea is to show them the kind of behavior that isn't appropriate. So when they're talking a lot in a movie theater or something like that, um, getting into it, because a lot of times they don't even realize there's anybody else around them, you know, and they're talking and they're having a good time. So this kind of helps them learn those rules. And it's, again, a video that's, that's helpful for that. This kind of shows them the private and the public. These are pictures taken from the program, so you can see the private versus the public. Um, and again, um, there's games, there's um, card games that you can, can play to sort of solidify some of these concepts. Uh, that's the spinner with um, the cards. You have to spin, and if it's a public, uh, anything public, person, uh, behavior, or place, they can play the card at level one. At level two, they have to actually identify the public behavior if they have that card. The public person if they have that card, the private behavior, the private place. So again, that's, that's another one. This is for the younger kids where they're just kind of looking and talking to you about what's public and what's private. The relationships do happen. It's a girl with a full mutation. She um, met this person online, scared her dad to death, but he went on the first date with him <laughs> to make sure it was a hockey game um, in Wisconsin. And um, they're very happy. Uh, she's, she's, she's really happy. They've made a decision not to have children because she's a full mutation, 
and she feels that um, even though she works at a daycare center and she's really good with young kids, um, that's not something she wants to do when she comes home. So I think that was a smart, smart move. He works at um, kind of a, I think he's got some delays as well, and he works at Walmart. We have, you guys probably have one of those. Um, and he's in the dairy department there, so they both work. This guy has a full mutation and got married to another individual who um, has disabilities. And what they've done is they, parents, her, his mom and stepdad have got everybody kind of living, not a compound, that sounds terrible, but they're all kind of together so that they have their house and they're close by so that if they need any support, they can. He works, she works. Um, uh, the not, not enough money to really support themselves, so mom is helping with that process so that they can have sort of a normal relationship and marriage. And then this is what I've been promising you, so I'll, I'll do this and then we'll get questions. So this is the family, um, the host home people who have taken Mike in and um, have really brought him into their family. They have a big family um, and everyone in that family loves Mike. They have figured out how to make it work for him and he truly is a different person. Hi Anne and Mr. <laughs> Wonderful over here, <laughs> Russ. Um, these are host home um, parents for one of the guys that I see with Fragile X at 70 and I asked them if they would do a little interview today to kind of give hope to the parents who are watching and who are here attending this seminar. So I'm going to turn it over to the experts. Thank you. Uh, Marsha, we, we asked to do this because we wanted to talk to parents and caregivers to give them hope and that you should never give up on your, your person, whether it's a child or whether it's an adult. Uh, Mike is 70. We've had him for approximately seven years, and the changes that we have seen are just phenomenal. The, the things that he continues to improve with every single day even at 70, are his, his behavior uh, improves all the time, his communication improves all the time, his cognitive abilities continue to improve, and his socialization continues to improve. And we see changes, positive changes, every single day, even at, at 70. So good. Evan? <laughs> You're on us. Uh, when, when we first got Mike, uh, there wasn't a day that went by that he didn't threaten to break my glasses and uh, otherwise be hostile about things. And giving him a shower was like, uh, you know, an unbelievable experience. Yes. And over a period of time, uh, you know, things just kept getting better and better. And now it's to the point where, uh, you know, his shower is fine. I mean, he's just very cooperative in all kinds of things. His his medications used yeah, to be a big, was a big deal. Big big deal. Boy, it was a fight and uh, to get him to take them and you had to not let him see you get them prepared and whatnot. You know, little things we tried to do. <laughs> That's right. And, we had all kinds yeah, of little schemes. And uh, <laughs> now it's like, hey, what about my medication? You know, he's just uh, all for it. He's it's just. Uh, kind of unbelievable the changes that we've seen uh, uh, like that and just his general uh, ability to sit down and be with him have a conversation talk about whether it's football or just anything he's just uh, a different sort of a guy yeah mm -hmm. I, I think um, Mike had been at the state hospital at one time and he had also then been in a lot of adult facilities hadn't been in a, and he'd been in one host home that was not a good environment either. He was, had to stay in the basement and he just paced and uh, he was very volatile. He would hit people, he would break out windows, car windshields, uh, have temper tantrums. A couple of times we had him in a medical appointment. They were gonna call the police because his behavior was so bad. And so, um, Anyway, this is the changes that we've seen have been almost miraculous. But I wanted to tell you about basically the, the changes that we made when Mike came to live with us. And, and we knew what we were, we knew that it, what his behavior was when yeah. we took him. Yeah. But, you know, we both had experience with special needs people and with behavior, so we took him anyway. <clears throat> I guess the 
first major change we made is we had to professionally evaluate his medications. He was way over medicated. Uh, they got his medications down to the point where the ones that he takes, he really needs, mm -hmm. and that was major. Mm -hmm. The other, the next change we made, and this was a difficult one, we insisted that he integrate into the family. Um, he mm -hmm. wanted to stay in his room. He wanted to go to his room any time anybody came to the house. Uh, but we just kept working on that, and we still work on that. Another change, a big change that we made was giving him choices. I don't th because Mike had always been in facilities, he had never had choices. And we, oh, okay, you don't want to eat with when we have company? Okay, mm -hmm. what, what do you want to do? Well, he wanted to sit in the office. Okay, you can sit in the office. Or you don't like cheese? Okay, we won't fix food with cheese. <laughs> uh, the, the one thing that we didn't give him choices about were his medications, so that was non-negotiable. Everything else, he had a choice, mm -hmm. and that made a big difference. And then the, probably the fourth big thing that we did is we started working with Dr. Braden because <laughs> we didn't know a whole lot about Fragile X, and we probably worked with her for maybe a year before Mike would even come into this office. He would stay home, he would sit in the car. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, then he started- Baby steps. Yeah. Baby, baby steps. Mm -hmm. And I was always convinced that Mike, although he has a diagnosis of not only the Fragile X, but autism and developmental delays, I was convinced that he was not developmentally delayed and uh, that he was very intelligent. He just, he just had a severe communication disorder. And so Marcia started working on all kinds of, of academic things. He had never been to school. He didn't know how to read, didn't know how to sign his name. And so this has been major for Mike because he really likes learning. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's, it's, been a, it's been a journey. And I'm not saying it's been quick. <laughs> or easy. <laughs> or easy. It's been about seven years. And he's finally to the point where... Um, he is a full member of our family. He is social to people who come to the house who he doesn't know. Mm -hmm. uh, he likes to be out in the community. He likes to go to football games. He likes to go to the grocery store. Um, he's just a different person. He really is. And for that, those kinds of changes to still be happening when he's 70 years old, there's a lot of hope for a lot of not only kids, but for adults. Thank you guys. I appreciate all you've done for him too. It's been a change, a big change, and he's a lot better for it, so thank you. Okay, they're my heroes. Um, I think we have a little bit of time for questions, and Wendy, I'm sorry I went over a bit. Okay, so um, anybody that knew Mike would think he was very low functioning, okay? Um, and again, I think it's all about giving them the opportunities to do things that um, they've not done before, to be able to foster that in a way that's positive. Um, if it's an individual with Fragile X that you're talking about, um, you know, Mike's in a wheelchair. Uh, Mike is nonverbal in a lot of ways. We've brought him around to the point, like she said, seven years, where he is now communicating and he is able to sort of join in. I think that's really important for these guys because they're very social. And does this person that's asking the question, is it a group home situation or a community support situation? Oh, it's okay. Sorry, I didn't want to embarrass you if you didn't. And I think it's a, an important question because there's a lot of families that do have low functioning um, mm -hmm. adults in their family. Mm -hmm. And it's important, particularly in the groups, when people are asking questions and they hear a lot about the achievements that, mm -hmm. that the higher functioning mm -hmm. groups have made, and then they're feeling <coughs> not. Think of the word, I understand. More anxious. Sure. Because their child's not matching. Right. The goals. Exactly. So how do we then approach? Like, I mean, I think what you say is brilliant, and it applies to any fragile X person. Mm -hmm. That the approaches to a lower functioning person needs to be slightly different to what you would do to the right. Functioning. 
Right, and that's a really good question because I've heard it before. And, and even when we have the panels where we have the, the guys at our, our international conferences and they're, they're verbal, for one thing, um, that sort of makes some of the audience feel as if their kid will never get there and will never do the same thing that uh, they're doing. So what I say about that is um, no matter, Mike's a good example, no matter when you get this individual or whenever you decide to start, you continue to start in the same way that we did with the other kids. Um, maybe we started when they were five, and they're the product of that now, and they're much higher functioning. But I still say it's a developmental delay, and we do know there's some cognitive deficits that um, really appear in certain individuals. So their, their IQ is much lower. We, we understand that. There's still a way to progress them, and I think developmentally, um, they will take the next step. So again, all of the strategies that um, we've talked about, so the scheduling, making sure that they know what's next. If it's a visual schedule and they can understand that, great. Maybe it's an object schedule, so that you have to do something like uh, fake, fake vegetables and that's their dinner, just to kind of let them know and this comes next and whatever, because they're not even at the stage where they can understand that a picture represents an object. So we're going to do something like that along the way. Maybe it's the, the toothbrush, and then and we have that in a row. And, um, and then it's the soap, and then it's the shower, whatever it is. We're going to figure out ways to introduce these strategies at a lower level, because they will be more comfortable. They will understand what you're asking them for, and then give them the opportunity to make those choices. So do you want to, um, you know, here's the soap, and here's the toothbrush. Do you want to shower first or do you want to brush your teeth first? So those are the ways that you can bring this all into play at a level that's kind of, um, you know, less, appeals to the less cognitively and, and more cognitively impaired individuals. I think everything we've talked about works in this population. You just have to whittle it down. You have to have um, sort of the, the object versus the picture, the words they don't read. You're going to have to figure out a way to compromise a little bit and to work it in a system that's going to be meaningful for those individuals that are lower functioning. But I think the main thing I want everyone to hear is to have that hope. I mean, people used to think I was nutcase because I'd say, no, we're, we're, he's going to read. You know, he's that 70 year old. I know they thought I was crazy. Um, parents didn't. But I, the funding source did. Um, and you know, how do you justify reading for a 70-year-old? Well, guess what? He is able now to get the, the grocery list together, and he is able to go to the store and make those choices, and he can pick out those uh, three or four items in the store. So to me, that's, that's it. That's what it's all about. He contributes. He's a member of the family. He feels good about himself. And um, who cares? I mean, I, I, to me, that's the end goal, however we have to get there. So again, I do think it also gives him a lot of pride. I think it's changed his personality. He doesn't want to be reclusive anymore. He wants to be a part of things um, because he now knows, he knows that somebody believes that he's smart, that he can do things. You know, sure, he's cognitively impaired. So I think any of these, just kind of whittle it down and work it. Okay. Anybody else? Depends on the of, uh, like uh, sending to special needs school or sending to a public school like a mainstream uh -huh. or a combination of both. Yeah, that's tough. It kind of depends on the kid. Um, we do know one thing: uh, they like being around people that are neurotypical. They model, they they imitate, right? Um, but we also know that they need a specialized, targeted intervention, so that just sitting in a classroom, for example is not inclusion, in my opinion. It's not mainstreaming. It's not picking up from uh, the instruction, maybe the social domain, maybe the behavioral domain. So I tell people, figure out why your ch what your child will get out of an included environment, OK? Let's figure out the purpose of that. Is it social? Cool. These kids are social. They imitate. They're going to be around typically developing individuals. That's probably a good thing. Is it behavioral because you want them to follow the instructions of somebody who's in charge, like they're going to be doing later in a job or whatever? That's cool, too. But let's figure out what that is.
Thank you for your cooperation. But that's not you. No. <laughs> so <laughs> what I'll do is I'll go in. We have this um, format that we follow, and I think we're going to put it in the videos, called Steps to Successful Inclusion. And what that's about is, let's say that we've decided we want to whittle out two hours of our child's day to have a social sort of environment and have some goals in that environment. I'm going to go in and I'm going to watch that child with Fragile X and also just randomly select another kid. And I'm going to write down what the teacher says, the instruction. I'm going to write down what the Fragile X kid does. And I'm going to write down what the typically developing kid does. Okay? So the teacher says, get your book out and turn to page 15. Okay? The Fragile X kid is doing fine. He looks around. He gets a book out. He has no idea where page 15 is in that book, right? Everybody else is going along with it. What does that say to me? That says to me that I need to either go to that teacher and I need to um, mark the page that she's going to tell him to go with a sticky note so that when he gets it out, he's going to be able to have a strategy and open it up and be like everybody else and participate. It also says maybe he needs to do that as a practice in his SPED uh, situation where he may be learning numbers and turning to that page and finding it. Okay, I now know what the skill is that I'm going to teach him to do better in that, in that situation. I also know that I could never structure things in his learning to have him participate like everybody else does. That's why he's been identified as special ed. He needs targeted instruction. But I think we have to say, okay, why is he here? What's he going to get from that included environment? And then what's he losing in the special ed uh, situation, okay? Maybe there's a skill that he needs to develop. Maybe he needs to learn to read really pretty well so that when he's in that environment, he can participate. There's also a need for him to be around typically developing individuals and behavior that they exhibit, right? So maybe we want him to be able to watch in that environment and kind of imitate what everybody else is doing so that when she's saying, we talked today, today with a couple of people when I did clinics about simultaneous cueing, which is a really difficult task for a lot of people. So that means they're busy doing something. The teacher says, um, group A, come over to the table and read with me, and they're doing some written exercise. They've got to be able to continue writing, and if they're not in group A, they keep writing, but they, if they are in group A, they need to stop and come over to the table. So that's listening and doing at the same time simultaneously. Those would be things I would target. I would actually contrive that in a special ed classroom and see if there's an opportunity for them to learn that skill and then to get into that included environment. So it's not just geography, meaning that you can't just put them in the room and say it's going to be magic and they're going to be included, right? But I do think for our kids, um, for kids with Fragile X, uh, they like to be included. They like to be with typically developing individuals because they model and they understand uh, sort of that system really well. But I would not, I wouldn't sacrifice one for the other. I would marry them in a very systematic and purposeful way. If that makes sense. Yep. Okay. Yes. Uh, in the video I saw uh, a couple of places where when the child has uh, behavioral problems, they can't cope and they cope with how beautifully uh, how is this with those kind of situations? What is it? So they said they about coping. Tell me that again. Uh, when the child has behavioral problems and they can't cope anymore, they cope with Yes. How do you please uh, because Chris has no uh, training of how to deal with these sort of children, what can they do? Exactly. This was at a doctor's office. The doctor's office called the police oh, okay. because they were afraid of Mike um, because he would yell and scream and hit the walls. Now, they're not, you're exactly right, they are not trained, and so in that case, we kind of thought, that's kind of ridiculous, right? Why would they do that? In the case of the guy that broke into his cousin's apartment, and it's kind of a sheltered situation, to me, that was an excellent learning experience for him because he wasn't going to be taken to jail, and they weren't going to cuff him, but they were going to come out and say, you know, you can't do this, and just having that uh, uniform and showing up because he's trying to break in, we were hoping, and fingers are still crossed, that he would never do that to a stranger, right? Or in, a, in an environment that is not a, like protected like that one was. But you're exactly right. They aren't. Yeah, even in the swimming pool, the swimming instructor said, you can't do that, mm -hmm. my child. Mm -hmm. And with the uniform or, or the 
person might sound like this, isn't it? Mm -hmm. How can the police with a uniform and child will give credit to that police and say, okay, I'll listen to you? Is that possible? So maybe you need to teach that. Yes. You know, you need to teach those community helpers and people's in a, people in authority. And that's really an important lesson with pictures and those kinds of things. Social Compass does a similar thing, okay? The doctor says to me that I need to draw blood, you know, I need to listen to that because he is a person that is in authority. So again, you, it's really a systematic approach to that, so you're teaching that skill. So they respect and listen, yeah. They don't listen to me, they're going to listen to... <laughs> Put on the... Well, once they get the, the, the police uniform, then you start wearing that around, right? <laughs> yeah. Have you any other Okay, so can you give me a scenario? Well, maybe that car scenario. So say, for example, the mum that was probably too engaged Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and potentially she walked away but he didn't follow, what? Walking away is one thing. Giving him a job, giving him something to take to grandpa, um, even putting something out for him to carry in but not in his space, so to speak. So once she turns away, when you get a minute, would you bring such and such and keep walking and hoping that he'll come at least to, to that point and, and carry it in. Uh, sometimes you can kind of make a, the next step happening that way. Um, it really is interesting with, with these guys because they don't, I mean, timeout works like a charm because they really want that connectedness with people. Whereas people on Spectrum, let me sit here and spin this string all night long, right? Leave me alone, I'm great. So I think that's part of what this is about, kind of the reason that it works because they want that attention, they want somebody there and yet, Giving that attention when they're that aroused is just putting them over the top. Yeah, yeah it's too much. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe a little link, you turn around, you walk away, but then you might just say, you know what, Mike, when you get a minute and, and if you decide to come, just anything like that. Indirect. Yes, yeah, take this with me. Very indirect. Yeah. Uh, side dialogue, if he, she had somebody yeah. there, that would have been a good one too, you know. Yeah. Grandpa to come out and just have a little conversation, he probably would have come around. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in regard to young women, Yep. I, I suspect they're vastly underdiagnosed, not as much clinical experience, and perhaps it's communication difficulties that give away the condition more than anything. The communication? Mm. Yeah, they, because they do they do talk and communicate. Quite social, yeah. But, where are the words but they're so shy. The words yeah, even right, articulating right. curricula not so much correctly. Not trouble maker, so they don't get as much. Attention. Right. That's a good point. With the females, oftentimes kind of shy, kind of um, hide in a way, you know what I mean? They're not out there and aggressive and that kind of thing, and so you don't pay as much attention to them. And um, they don't get the attention related to their needs as much. Yeah, that's so a good point. So look out for communication difficulties. Yep. And uh, that's how sometimes funding can be uh, accessed. Secured. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. That's a good point. Thank you. Mark, I have a question too, um, just related to girls who may be afraid to let children because um, it's certainly um, uh, the case, isn't it, that many women who are afraid to let children don't have intellectual disability. It is around the communication difficulties. And I wonder whether you could describe some of the other um, uh, challenges that girls and women with fragile X syndrome have, uh, if not the intellectual disability. Sure. Some of the challenges that may um, include daily living or in um, an education environment or in a work environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So most people um, with fragile X that are females, you know, have two Xs and they have one X that's unaffected. And so that makes it a little bit of a better situation for them. Um, they can function usually higher than, than the males. But socially, it's really difficult for them. They are usually shy. Um, they can cover it up pretty well sometimes, but uh, underneath uh, several layers, if you push it too much, they become really frustrated and uh, can't communicate oftentimes because they shut down. Some of them uh, giggle or laugh when they're anxious. And if they're in a dating situation or with a male, 
and the male may be doing something that they don't like or kissing or petting or that kind of thing and they start giggling because they're anxious, um, they don't understand why the guy gets really upset with them. Because the guy's, the message to the guy is, I like this, it's funny, this is cool or whatever, and they're really trying to say, I'm scared to death and I laugh when I'm scared. And that's, that's something a lot of people do. You've noticed that in, in individuals. Um, they also have a hard time, I think, um, with direct confrontation. Um, when they perceive that there's a conflict anywhere, it scares them a lot. And so um, they get into situations like in my group therapy. If somebody is talking about, now this is, this is really the truth, uh, against the, the football team that they like, okay, and it's really making them upset, but they don't say a word about it. They just kind of, you know, put it inside. The next appointment, I will get a call and they will say they're ill. They can't come because they're sick. Now, is it really that? Or they're so upset they don't want to face another conversation about their football team that, you know, they, that's really what it is. And so you have to kind of look into, okay, that's their escape, but let's confront it. Let's talk about it. So the next time, uh, let's tell Sarah that we are a Denver Bronco fan and we didn't appreciate her talking about the New England Patriots or whatever the heck it was. Um, and we, you know, that's the kind of thing that they avoid and they, they literally will change um, their life around those confrontations. Um, a lot of them have said to me, you know, I heard mom on the phone the other day and she was really upset over such and such and I just can't take it anymore. I don't know what this, and they're very dramatic at times, very dramatic, and they come up with all these crazy ideas about what's going on when they really don't know. And instead of asking or initiating, that's a problem. Executive functioning deficits, coming up with a plan, executing it, and finishing it up. Very difficult. So there are a lot of projects that go unfinished. There are a lot of things that don't happen because they can't execute and finish things out. They would rather take a message, leave a message, than talk directly to somebody. They would rather text. A lot of our boys do the same thing. But again, they're avoiding that direct confrontation. So. Yeah, really high. Yeah, anxieties and the panic, as we said earlier, um, a lot of them do have panic attacks, and that's really scary. That's really awful.